Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our Mass Timber Office Forum. Um, my name is Matt Holman. I'm a partner at GNT within our project management division. Um, today's session is our penultimate session um, on uh, fo well, focusing on leasing and sales. Um, here is our agenda today. It's our normal format. Um, so Oliver Booth, also a partner of the firm uh, working in our QS division, uh, will introduce our panelists shortly. We'll then get into our uh, usual sort of Q&A type session, uh, which will include um, poll questions as previous um, and some live questions. So don't forget to use your chat function on the on the on the system to ask those and we'll try and weave those in as we go. And if failing that, we'll we'll put them at the end and failing all of that, we'll include um, some responses to those questions in our summary report. Um, I'll then look to close the session. Um, and by introducing um, the last of our uh, sessions in this series. So um, without further ado, um, Ollie, do you want to introduce our panellists, please? Yes, please, Matt. Uh, thank you very much and good morning to everybody. Uh, and so to today's eagerly awaited Mass Timber Commercial Office Forum on the topic of sales and leasing. Our four panellists are a mix of very experienced commercial agents or represent large development organisations such as CBRE, JLL, Lend Lease Development and Bywater Properties, respectively. This morning, we will hear our panellists' thoughts on any trends that might be emerging in what tenants today are looking for when considering commercial office space. And why a tenant or wider variety of tenants might be drawn to an office space made predominantly from or partially constructed from mass timber. We will debate what benefits tenants might see from taking space in, in mass timber offices, or indeed if tenants could have concerns or reservations about it. And of course, how mass timber offices might fare in the brave new office world post pandemic and responding to the ambitious and uncompromising net zero targets that both government and organizations have made promises to reach. And so to our panel. First, we'll start with Dan Hanna is an executive director at CBRE. During his 15 years at CBRE, Dan has been focused on London regeneration projects of scale. He enjoys studying societal change and applying his lessons to property to create the most relevant long term places possible. Dan also has just completed an executive MBA from the Imperial College Business School, focusing on sustainable business and the future role of the workplace. Dan is keen to play his part in bringing the occupier and investor communities together to make London's built environment more circular, greener, and ultimately maximize social and economic value. And next to Michael P. Davis, who is head of London Unlimited at JLL. Michael has spent 18 years in the property industry and has worked within the agency investment and development fields. He heads up the JLL UK regeneration business and is considered one of the UK's foremost ex experts on future real estate trends and complex large scale mixed use reg regeneration projects. Michael is actively involved in a number of wood based projects and co authored a, a leading piece of research into modular CLT office design alongside GT, Scott Brown, Rick Ramble, and Storenzo. Kevin Chapman is part of the development team at Lendlease as their director of leasing and origination. Kevin brings over 30 years of experience to his role, which includes product development, leasing, and workplace expertise across Lendlease's commercial office development pipeline. This includes the International Quarter in Stratford, Elephant and Castle, Millennium Mills, Euston, and Smithfield, Birmingham. Prior to his 10 years at Lendlease, Kevin was UK property director at CLS Holdings, where he helped deliver the Shard and adjacent news building. Lendlease have already completed several mass timber offices in Australia, including the notable examples such as the six storey International House and six storey Duramaru House, both located in Sydney, and the 10 storey 25 King William Street, Brisbane, as well as many others. Lendlease currently has a development pipeline of around 60 billion across Australia, Asia, Europe, and North America. And finally, to Daniel Mead, who is head of asset manager at Biowater Property. Bywater Properties is a privately owned property company with office-led investment and development projects in London and the rest of the UK. Dan has over 20 years of experience in leasing, investment and asset management of real estate across the UK. Daniel is currently leading the leasing and asset management of Bywater's CLT-framed 60,000 square foot office project, Paradise, in Vauxhall, which you may have read about in the press. Bywater secured planning permission from the London Borough of Lambeth for the NLA award-winning project at the end of 2020, and it will start on site later this year. As always, the GNT team would just like to thank all of our panelists for giving us their time in contributing to today's forum. Thanks, Matt, and we are good to go. 
Great. So we'll get into our questions in, in a short while, which we'll, we'll go on to sort of market trends, as Ollie mentioned, the product and market value, and get onto some international um, bits and bobs as well. But as ever, just to make sure you're all awake, uh, Ollie, do you want to start with a poll question, please? Yes, please. So poll question number one, it's been popping up on your screens now. So in your experience as developers, what is the tenant occupier's top priority when looking for real estate? Please click one of these answers. Is it wellness, health and well-being? Sustainability, getting to net zero, cost of the office space, cost of service, maintenance, location, floor plate size, or say number of columns or lack of columns, if that may be the case. If you could click one of those, please. Give you a few seconds to answer that. Kevin's Kevin back. Kevin's back now. Yep. Good. Good. <clears throat> answers? And our answers are in. Uh, so a massive 52% is location. Um, second, cost of the office space at 37%. Um, there is 4 and 7% for wellness, health and well-being, sustainability, net zero. But as ever, we will publish the findings to you all afterwards and it will find its way into our in our paper afterwards as well. Thanks, Matt. Great. So um, let's kick off some, with some questions then. So Kevin and Dan, uh, Dan Mead that is, uh, um, let's start with market trends. So from your experience, what are tenants looking for in their spaces? Um, and to, to follow that, have you noticed a change in these key drivers over the last 12 months uh, and what the change has been? So who wants to kick that off? Um, Dan Mead or, my, uh, or Kevin? Kevin? Well, I'm happy to go, yeah, for sure. Okay. Now I'm back on. Thank you. Thanks for that, Matt. Um, it's an interesting one, this one, because when we were thinking about the question earlier, we were saying, you know, is it sustainability, health and well-being, you know, how we build it, biophilia and all that stuff. I think what COVID's actually done is it's, it's made all of those things givens. So as developers, we have to deliver that. And I think most of our customers expect us to deliver that as a given. Um, I think where they're going to take us post-COVID is very much into what the, the sort of purpose of the development is. You know, what, what, what are you there for? What are you going to do for me? Um, I think the experience of, for workers, for staff, for visitors coming into their building. Um, you know, we've got a job to do to get people to give up the comforts of home and come into the office. So the experience of walking into that office uh, is going to play a big part, I think. And this is where Timber has an ace card uh, because it can do things with sort of touch and smell that steel and concrete sort of can't really do. And I think tenants are also going to be more mindful of their neighbourhoods when they come back. They're going to they're going to want to see that they're part of some part of a community, part of something a bit bigger than just a building. Um, be it sort of Spitalfields or Stratford, they're going to want to feel that they're, they're in a place of difference that they can tell their mates about, that they can tell their customers and their shareholders about what it stands for. So I think in that context, um, Timber has a massive role to play in how we evolve the product going forward. And I think probably, you know, what's been the biggest change over the last 12 months, I think people are talking about the experience of going back into the office. So that partially falls on the developer, the landlord, to create the sort of uh, the foundation, the, the shell of the office. But it's also about the interior design um, and how you can improve that. And of course, how you operate the space, how people move through it, who comes in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, who gets Thursdays and Fridays. Um, so the experience of being there, I think is gonna, is gonna play hard. And you know, when you're dealing with timber, in the larger office buildings, in the context of place that's got real purpose, um, then you can really start to sort of put the scores on the doors with uh, with, with uh, the use of timber through commercial buildings. Dan, Dan Mead, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think it was interesting to see the, the results from the, the, the poll question with uh, two or seven percent, I, I can't remember what the number was, um, picking net carbon zero as being, a, a you know, the most important factor that, that tenants um, are, are looking for at the moment. So I think that's really interesting. I think that's where the world that we work in is changing so quickly at the moment and has changed immeasurably over even the last three, six months. 
Um, we're having a lot more of our tenant inquiries are now coming from tenants that are sort of aware of their impact in that world and, and, and are asking more questions on that front. But I, I think what's really interesting is that, you know, tenants are really starting to join the dots between how they, you know, if they, they made a commitment maybe loosely or, or, or formally last, last month to their board to get to net carbon zero base, say 2030, pick a date. Um, how do they actually get there? Well, actually real estate plays a massive part and a huge part in, in, in you know, helping them to achieve that. Um, UN Climate Change estimates that by the end of 2020, companies with a combined, I've obviously written this down, um, combined turnover of over $11.4 trillion have now made a firm commitment to achieving net carbon zero by whatever date they've chosen. That's half the GDP of the US. So this is, you know, it's a real thing. And that's, that's doubled in the last year. So this is becoming exponential. Um, I, I see that as being, if we ask the same question in a year's time, that 7% would have gone to sort of, you know, 35, 40%. Location, I think, will always be the most important. But then some of the factors that Kevin mentions, but net carbon zero is coming, you know, right up there on, on, on uh, right up on the sides of them. And clearly timber, for reasons that we'll go, go into in a minute as a, as a group, has a massive bearing on that and can, and can affect massive change in that. Um, so I think that's a, you know, that's the big thing for me in the last six months. I think to Kevin's point, tenants just now expect bike stores, showers, um, you know, connectivity, all of that kind of stuff as an absolute prereq. Um, recycled, recycling on site, uh, renewable energies, almost a, you know, it's almost a prereq now. So that's the bit about carbon, you know, embodied carbon and what we can do to help them with embodied carbon. But if we marry the two up, I think, you know, that's where, where timber really comes in. So have, you noticed any, have you noticed any changes in the last 12 months in terms of space allocation, open plan, um, you know, cellular offices? But how, how have you noticed the changes that are on, on the drawing board? I mean, anecdotally, at, at, at this point, in terms of, uh, you know, we have the, the benefit or the, uh, or the um, challenge of, of having finished three refer projects during lockdown. Um, so we're now leasing them in, in what is a really challenging and fluid mask market. But... Yeah, we are definitely seeing more inquiries from tenants that are looking for less open plan space, more at least partially cellularized space. Um, not going back to the old, you know, kind of, you know, completely cellular office space, but I, I get the feeling again, anecdotally, I've got no kind of data to support it, that tenants want at least some areas that they can either sanitize and have teams working in, or they can use the Zoom calls and things like that. You know, that we've definitely had, three or four inquiries from tenants recently asking for have you got a zoom room for example which a year ago would have meant absolutely nothing to us um so you know it, it, it is changing and i see it changing towards that kind of slightly more serialization albeit not exclusively so michael bringing you in on that um so what changes have you noticed uh, in the in the market um probably probably in terms of attacking this sort of in terms of value proposition and the variety of stock it's quite interesting I, i'll probably best illustrate it using two case studies one was a project a wooden project that i was working on started on it two years ago pre-covid and there was definitely a desire to put a premium on the building and you know and outstrip the local the local prevailing kind of market rents obviously through covid what has happened is actually it's just made that rental tone more resilient now and I think off the back of that, when people come back to work, as Kevin was saying, we'll see a definite kick in values around more sustainable stock. And, and, and at the moment, I mean, this is sort of an appeal to all developers because the number of CLT or CLT hybrid buildings that are out there is still relatively limited. There's an opportunity to attach premium out there just because of supply and demand and the desirability that comes of it. Because from I do occupier work as well, and there are, there are more occupier clients of ours that are asking for sustainable wood-based or, 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 or you know, well-certified buildings than there are available in the market. So, so from, a, from a pound, shilling and pence perspective, there's definitely an opportunity for, from, from, from that angle. But also, I mean, it's interesting if you flip this and look at the investment side of things as well, because you know, there's only um, literally a handful of buildings in London that have ever traded that have been CLT constructed. And, there's, and to my knowledge, there's only two that have been office-based. And, and speaking to the purchaser and the seller, actually the considerations around sale were not about anything that's been talked about in previous forums here. It's not about 
you know, f as long as fire safety and insurance and things like that are taken care of, there are no other value implications at all. So, so you know, in terms of creating an institutionally investable product, the, there's no problem at all. So I think going forward, they're just, you know, frankly, speed to market, uh, retrofitting buildings, whether it be in whole or part, people should be looking for, to, in my view, to, to CLT um, ahead of steel. Great, okay. Um, so Kevin, just to finish off the, the market uh, bit, uh, is there a trend in the sort of tenants or in the uh, sector of tenants um, that is interested in mass timber office buildings that, that you're seeing at the moment? Um, I think I'd have to say no. I think it, it's probably not sector specific. Um, I mean, there's no doubt the more sort of progressive businesses uh, are leading the charge, certainly those that have nailed their colours to the mast in terms of made corporate statements about their net zero carbon journey. Um, I think many of them are actually trying to work out how the hell they're going to get there, uh, turning to their real estate teams and saying help. Um, so I think certainly the more progressive are on it. I think the government are definitely on it. They sort of understand it. Um, the creative sector, I think probably banking and finance is still a little cautious, um, but the consultancy world gets it. I mean, the buildings that we've done in Australia have been largely consultancy led. Uh, the, I think certainly the flex and the co-working sector, those operators get it because they know that their customers, even at the SMA and the small business end, uh, want to experience timber buildings as much as the large corporates do. They're just as demanding. And if they can set up a flex operation in a building that has that timber offer, um, they know they're going to have a, a, a better pull over their competitors. So I'd say it's, it's, it's definitely the more progressive, those that have made the commitment that are leading the charge. Um, but it's probably not sector specific uh, at the moment. Cool. Okay, I've just had, we've just had a, a really interesting question in from, from James Pellet. And I'm, hi, James. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad he asked this question um, because it, I'll, I'll read it to you now, guys. Uh, given that over the last decade, occupiers have been happy to search all over London, I'm surprised that location scored so highly in our poll question. And I, I'm glad he asked that because I was as well. Uh, do you think that an occupier will move away from a preferred location for a net zero carbon building, especially if they come from the service sector? Um, I don't even want to pick that up, but I, I, I'm so glad he's asked that question because I was thinking that when the, when the answers came up. But um, who, wants, who wants to pick that up? Go, go for it, Mike. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And sorry, I was going to comment before. I, it was interesting to see how polarised that poll result was because certainly from the occupier landscape, what peop, what companies are actually searching for are best-in-class buildings. And and if you use you know CLT, sustainability, m and &E specification, design, they all form part of an overall gamut of what creates the best in class buildings. So there've been, there've been some reasonably sized deals that I've done in the last kind of 18 to 24 months where we have quite literally looked from Chiswick to Silvertown and everything in between. And invariably, you know, most recently a deal that I was negotiating on two buildings simultaneously, one tenant, one was at uh, Liverpool Street and the other one was in Paddington because they were two buildings that were determined to be best in class. So I think the, the, the geographical elasticity driven by sustainability will absolutely be the norm going forward. Agree with that. I don't think we should get too disheartened by that initial poll. I think, you know, location is relative. Um, and also, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, price as well to an extent. So I think um, occupiers are always going to look to for the moon on a stick and try and get the best best space at the least price so it'd be good to rerun that and uh and take those two out i think and take them as givens yeah cool okay thanks thanks guys um right let's uh, focus a bit more on the product itself then so i'll ask dan mead um this one uh are there benefits to mass timber offices for tenants uh over other more traditional traditionally built spaces um if you can just explain those for us yeah, I think aside from the, um, you know, the previous points we made about about net carbon zero and how you can maybe get there a bit quicker as an occupier if you if you're in a timber building, but the one that um, you know sticks in 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 my head and something that we're pushing hard on and we're we're currently running the sort of pre leasing of our uh, work on our paradise project down in Vauxhall, um, so we're doing a fair bit of work on this. But the, the health benefits, um, Kevin mentioned. Um, 
some of the kind of more psychic benefits of, of proximity to timber and biophilia, um, for want of a better word. Um, studies have shown in, in, in places like Oregon, British Columbia and in, 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 in Canada of late that there are genuine health benefits of being um, working in, in an environment close to close to timber. It can reduce your blood pressure. It can um, actually increase, uh, sorry, increase, decrease stress levels. Um, and this sort of general feeling that people like to be closer to, to sort of timber environments. So, so there's that um, is, is, a, is a really, really big factor for us. And one that, you know, there is science that backs it up. And, you know, it's un, it, I, I suppose it's undeniable that one of the big factors that occupiers are looking for is health and well-being throughout their buildings. Therefore, there's a you know, direct um, uh, uh, benefit, notwithstanding the, the you know the improve the, the health benefits for, for for construction workers and people on the on the, on the build phase in terms of building materials out of um, timber. There's also the um, you know one kind of um, area that we're going hard on with our um, marketing material is the ability to reuse and 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 reimagine the spaces if you like. And obviously, um, British Land have been able to do this in in you know to with quite good examples in Awesome Road and Hackney, um, but you can actually, it's not just us saying 50 years, uh, 50 years in the future will, somebody can dim out this and recycle it and reuse it, but that's genuinely, you know, genuinely possible. Um, you've seen people cutting into slabs and, and, and building staircases out of existing, you know, materials within the existing frame. So, you know, none of that's anywhere near possible, whether it's the health benefits or the reuse um, with other materials. Um, uh, just off the top of my head. Um, that's great. That's great. That's cool. Thank you. Um, so, Kevin, Kevin, you mentioned earlier actually that uh, a number of tenants that you've been speaking to did get it. Um, but have you any feedback on the negative side? Any any reservations, concerns, limitations, or, or cons in relation to mass timber offices that you know would need to be addressed or myths that need to be busted, so to speak? Kevin, you're on mute. Sorry. You'd think after a year we'd have cracked it. Um, I, th I think on the whole, there's, there's probably not, not a huge sort of wall of skepticism about timber. I think most occupiers are, are embracing it. Probably the, the couple of um, comments that we've come across. Um, firstly, the sort of, particularly with glue lamb beams, uh, if you've got services overhead, that sort of does restrict your flexibility a bit to punch further you know, utilities through. You've got to go round probably rather than through it unless it's been pre-drilled before it's been installed. Um, but again, there is an answer to that, that you sort of, you know, use the uh, raised floor for the air and you feed the air through there. So there's a solution to that. Um, I think there probably are in some spheres a little bit of concern around fire. Um, and some of that is unfounded, I suspect. Uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, Grenfell still going on. Um, there is some sort of wariness about it. I think once people get educated um, and the work you've done, Matt, in your first few seminars have been very good in that regard. I think those barriers are being broken down, but I think there's an element of that that just sticks in people's minds. Um, but the, the real thing is, I think we just don't have enough product in the UK to show our customers what it can look and feel like. They're definitely coming. We know that most of us on this call are involved in projects that are delivering it. But as soon as we can get some up, we found this in Australia when we did the first timber building at Barangaroo. Once you've built one and people can come in and sort of hug that column, which they do, I hasten to add, um, and you can walk in and you can smell it, you know, the, the people just get it. You know, they realize that this natural material that they might've done an extension at home with, or they've got a cabin in the garden that they work in, it's fine, you know, it works. Um, so I think overall, not, not, a, not a huge wall of resistance to it. Just a few things we in the industry have got to educate on, I think. Great. OK, thank you. So uh, let's just focus on the aesthetics uh, part of it, Dan, um, Dan Mead. Um, can mass timber offices contribute to, to the circular economy and can the desire to be sustainable conflict with aesthetic requirements? Um, I think that's, we haven't had a question like that before. It's quite a key one. Um, would you be able to pick that one up? Yeah, sure. I mean, I suppose there's a couple of parts to it. The aesthetic bit that, um, that Kevin just sort of picked out, I think, is um, the sort of the first part to deal with. We're, 
Yeah, I think until we see more of these buildings come through, and there are um, non-commercial buildings around the UK that you can go to in terms of you know libraries and and other kind of you know uses that you can see this, but there are there aren't many examples of actually seeing this in an office environment in the UK. So it's difficult to know how people will react to the aesthetics. But you know, clearly there's ways you can break it up and dress it, whether it may be you know elements of staining or you know furniture and and things that go into the building to break up that visual impact. But I think I'm with Kevin that actually when people do get close to it, they kind of probably fall in love with it for all of the health reasons that I've said. Like I say, there is science attached to that and people do like being close to wood and close to, you know, natural natural um, materials. In terms of the, the circular economy, um, I suppose the point on that is, um, you know, building, building something like Paradise Land and Vauxhall that we're building, that's only one step and, and, and a small step along the way in terms of, um, you know, the full life cycle of a building and its, and its carbon impact. So what goes into that building, maybe to break up that aesthetic, but, you know, but certainly to, for, for tenants to use their fit out and their furniture is, you know, it, it, it is, it is almost a bigger step. And the circular economy, I think, point relates to, you know, do you put new furniture into a, uh, into a into a timber building and undo all of the good work that you've done by um, by building it out of timber in the first place. My answer to that question is no. You should you should you should look to sort of manage that you know the next stage of the embodied carbon process by using um, furniture from renewable, remanufactured, recycled um, sources um, alongside all of the work that you do with renewable energy and, and, and in the management phase. I think if that answers your question. Yeah, that's well, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, question for Dan, uh, other Dan, uh, Dan H. Uh, uh, what impact might the drive towards net, um, net zero carbon have on the future of green leases? Uh, and how might mass timber facilitate this? Well, I think um, it's going to have a big impact on green leases, you know, because net zero carbon is becoming um, a business imperative. And I think that's going to help to drive the agency and legal communities to understand and execute this whole area better. Because I think at the moment there's a there's really a deficit of understanding around that. I also think we're going to see more interdependence between occupiers and investors. Um, I think there's going to be a realization that actually there's a there's an opportunity here around asset value. I mean, to quote our in-house expert Helen Newman, you know, she says, "Do green leasing, not green leases." Um, so it's taking a life cycle approach, not just looking at the lease, which I think, you know, is, is makes absolute sense. Um, I would say it's not just net zero carbon, though, um, as a driver towards the conscientious lease. I think, you know, it's more generally the ESG imperative. And I think we are moving into an ESG obsessed epoch, if you like, era, um, you know, and to quote Mark Carney, you know, values are going to equal value. Um, so, you know, I do think there will be more green leases and I think also within those green leases, there's going to be more pro-social clauses as well. Um, so it's going to be about community. Um, and frankly, as Mike said at the beginning, that's why there's such a big opportunity for investors of scale. You know, they can embed their ESG strategies within their core business and wider communities. And wh when that's manifested, you know, in a building, in a lease, that's where you get value. You know, so there is that whole kind of opportunity to build a golden thread from your build, your lease, your rent review, your operation, your community engagement, your sale and your reuse. So, you know, there's a, there is a big opportunity here. So it, it can't be one of those things where it's kind of like, we don't like that clause, let's scrub it out, it's too hot. You know, I think we're moving beyond that and there's some great pioneers around this. Um, the second part of the question in terms of you know, how might mass tim facilitate this? You know, operational carbon is obviously incredibly important. And, you know, it's great to see all the neighbours stuff and, and the excitement around that. But, you know, arguably it will take operational carbon, you know, 50, 60 years to catch up with the embedded upfront carbon and climate change is immediate. Um, you know, I often think that sometimes sustainability is kind of, hiding in plain sight and we need more examples in the industry to sort of bring out the shadows and I really think you know CLT and timber you know can be a pin-up to kind of do that and, and that certainly happened 
you know, with Kevin and, and Len Lease in Australia. But I do think it can be a beacon for reducing carbon and, and get people excited about it, the investor, the, the occupier and the funding communities. And then just finally, I do think that occupiers are much more likely to partner with an investor who's included timber because it says a lot about the value of the investor. You know, it says that they've taken time to take positive change. You know, it takes skill, it takes patience, it takes purpose. I mean, Lend Lease is a great example. You look at what Landsec are doing as well at Timber Square. I mean, they're 75% timber. It's doing many great things, but you know, something that people might not mention is it cuts down lorry journeys by 6,000 over the life cycle of construction. And that's, you know, that means something about safety to the local area. So there are lots of reasons and it's just, a, it's for us, you know, my marketeers to explain the benefits, I think. That, and that, that, that's where the missing link is, we need to explain that. Interesting, right. sorry, Matt, just to add to, to Dan's point there, that's, you know, the, the one thing we I would pick up from that is education, is educating people. We're going through this at the moment, trying to mark how we get those big messages across to people. We can, you know, we can we we can get the 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 carbon stats over. They're you know their numbers. They make a bit more sense, albeit there's some heavy weight behind them, and we have to get people's heads around them. But but you know how do you how do you you know how do you get that those points across, and how do you kind of um, market that in a in a in an easy to digest way? Well, we do more of it, and people get more comfortable with the messaging. But at the moment, we're trying to work that out. That's the that's the big thing we're facing. The frustration, Dan, that we're facing is trying to get people's heads around this and actually how they understand it. And that's the marketing, the sales, and leasing bit, really, in a nutshell. Yeah, I think you know, Dan, with your business, this is all going to be about having authenticity. You know, right from the grassroots to the most senior people in the business. I don't think you can just kind of say, you know, we're net zero carbon. We believe in it. So you know, you would have a competitive advantage there, definitely. Okay. Thanks, guys. So, uh, Michael, um, are there any particular office spaces or uses that would suit uh, mass timber offices? And um, we've got a slide here as well, just to help you facilitate your your answer. Yes, there are. Um, I mean, I, th I think the interesting thing here is I've tried to put together um, a, a mood board to show people that, frankly, CLT can be applied in a number of different instances in different locations, because I think there's a misconception that, oh, you know, it only really works on new build and it doesn't work on tall buildings and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and just to reinforce some of the points that Dan, the two Dans made earlier on, there's a building there called Technique, which is sort of in the middle and on the left-hand side, which is a Victorian warehouse in Clark and Well, you know, built sort of late 1800s. And the project that we're, we're on site at the moment is two new floors of CLT on top um that clt slab and structure and so some people say that clt is too yellow when you see it in the flesh well actually because this is a design-led project where we are lime washing the clt so you'll get a very scandinavian feel which is the image on the bottom left but coupled with this and going back to the point around can sustainability be cool or design-led or what have you we're also building an extension to the building, which you can see it's that light gray piece to the, to the left of the, the, the building in the center. That's made of Danish brick, which are made of 100% recyclable materials. And then in the reception area, which is the, 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 the image um, top, top left, um, that's, those tiles are made and designed by an Italian design house called Forma Fantasma, who've won a uh, Milan Design Week um, award a number of times. They're made out of volcanic ash so there's a whole story here a narrative around being design-led really slick but the sustainability criteria is really strong and i'll happily share the marketing brochure with anybody on the call um, there's a whole section not just dedicated to, to, to sustainable design but also you know reduced vehicular movements reduced embodied carbon etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's actually a really forward thinking approach in the marketing to try and attract someone who's design-led but obviously someone who's got ESG um, desires as well. Um, Halbury, which is the image on the bottom, is actually a consented scheme um, for one of the science parks, business parks just outside of Oxford. And that's again, um, a modular approach, new build site, um, you know, modest height. But again, it shows how it can be done in areas where the land value is less and the rental value is less as well. You know, really an innovative design, you know, uh, CLT uh, structure, but with an external glass um, facade and gives a really interesting kind of cantilevered effect over the water. Um, 
And then bottom right is a really interesting one that's just been consented called Roots in the Sky. So this is the um, Blackfriars Crown Court site. Um, so the court, you can't see it in the image, is actually kept there. And it's a modular CLT structure that is essentially um, constructed over the top of the existing building. Now, the atrium, which you can't see from here, is, is absolutely fantastic, a mixture of um, green painted steel structure with, a, with, with CLT slabs in it. Um, but, but going back to the point around design and other facets and that complete package, this building has a one acre, one acre rooftop garden with over 10,000 plants and a swimming pool. And they're putting in community, there's about 20,000 square foot of community led workspace on the ground floor. And they're creating a new internal street for the public to access. So, so you, when you put that together, it can, becomes quite a compelling offer. And in the context of central London, you know, this will be one of the best buildings out there. Um, and then lastly is the Gramphone Works, which is on site uh, up near um, Ladbroke Grove, Kensal Rise, which will be completed in about, I think, six or seven months time. CLT uh, in majority with a bit of concrete thrown in there. But again, a really interested zinc, sort of gold zinc external cladding, you know, roof terraces over the canal. Again, really playing the whole wellness and well-being card. So what I'm trying to illustrate here that, you know, the CLT story can fit in in, in all shapes and sizes, whether it be hybrid or 100% um, uh, new build. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. That's brilliant. Great. Um, so, Dan Hamlin, um, how do you think mass timber offices might fit in a post-pandemic UK? Um, nice open question for you. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> I think it's important to start by saying that you know, for many, when we return to work, it will be a challenging market. Um, but if we look at the supply and demand dynamics or look at the supply side dynamics that, you know, there is a shortfall of um, the development pipeline for kind of best in class space. So, you know, we do think there's going to be a situation where it's kind of the best and the rest when it comes to grade A offices. Um, and I think that, you know, timber offices, to echo some of what's been said on this call already, you know, is going to provide a real competitive advantage. I say that because I think it will really capture the corporate zeitgeist and that shift to stakeholder capitalism. So from a symbolic perspective, I think it's important. Um, and look, in, in a post-COVID world, I think the office is going to be used to redress the deficit of working from home. So I think mental health is going to be really important. I think air quality, ESG and progressive culture. I think those four things will come to the fore and they will be the key pillars for successful companies. And actually, if you look at timber and all the great stuff that's been discussed on this call, you know, it, it can be, it can solve for a lot of these problems. And I think that's a really important point. So it's not bricks and mortar, it's a business solution. And I, I would go back to the mental health one as well. You know, there's some great studies that Dan mentioned from Aust Austria and Australia, and I think Holland as well, around you know the mental health attributes of timber it's used in schools it's used a lot in life science so you know we know that there's a massive you know global problem around it and actually i think this can really help to solve for that um i would also say that i do think that there's going to be a spotlight on authenticity transparency and governance going forwards you know when you add in the power of social me um, social media I think your building is going to be massively scrutinized for its key ingredients, you know, just as meat is being now and, you know, how, and how coffee has been in the past. So, you know, question, perhaps we're moving to a sort of beyond meat in inverted commas and fair trade coffee office market. Yeah. I mean, let's get it out there. Everyone's looking for competitive advantage. And frankly, as I said before, we're moving into a, an ESG obsessed epoch. I mean, fi the final thing I would say around that is that, you know, we're all a product of our own environment. Um, and I saw in the news last week how cherry blossom trees are being planted in some of the most deprived areas of the UK, which I thought was was really interesting. And I think switched on CEOs would use the timber office as a bit of a magnet to attract talent back to work and almost sort of refresh and kind of reset baseline social norms for their work culture. And I think as a business, if you can create a more conscientious behavior, you know, that is your key currency going forwards. 
So what I'm saying is if you get it right, and there's a lot of ifs, but it could really enhance your brand equity. So I think that's quite exciting. Mm. Really interesting answer, Dan. Thanks for that. And Mike, Mike, Michael, just um, just to finish off on, on that element before we go on to our next poll question, actually, you've got just a quick thought on uh, the current building sustainability assessment methods and BCO standards and the like. Uh, are they fit for purpose for, for what we're talking about here? No, absolutely. I mean, look, throwing it out there, I've always had a bit of a love-hate relationship with the BCO generally because I've always felt it lagged behind where it needed to be, but that's that's just my view. Um, it's quite it's quite interesting though because I think things move so quickly. I mean, frankly, if we'd have had this chat a year ago when you know a number of people on this call would be, were starting to starting to or delivering CLT projects, we wouldn't have been talking about air handling uh, because COVID didn't exist or or it was just about to come online. Um, and I think it's that overall package. You know, Dan touched on earlier. I was going to mention about you know neighbours. Um, you know that that's quite an interesting metric and i think probably the most important metric because frankly there's more embodied carbon used you know in the, in the life cycle of, of the building and the operational side of things and also looking at procurement of green energy you know there's i think there's a i think there's a responsibility on all major developers to have an active role in participating or bulk buying green energy products because there's there's always you know, from an occupier's standpoint, there always seems to be, well, you're the landlord, you know, you sort it all out and we'll just pay, you know. And, and I think I, I think that that's where the landlord market needs to take a proactive stance. Um, I think just on the BCO point, I mean, I did say it slightly tongue in cheek. I think, you know, unfortunately for the BCO, because it takes a while to execute any of the any of the new kind of design standards. And the last one was 2019. You know, there's actually it, it's overdue a refresh. And I think sustainability needs to be one of the cornerstones of that refresh more generally but i think that i i mean dare I say it, you know dan you hit the nail on the head um i think there's an opportunity there for a new a new kind of metric to come in particularly to the uk market or the european market um there's there's you know the, the green leases piece is, is going to become increasingly pertinent more generally and actually it's still quite a gray area because technically green leases have been around for about 20 years and it used to be well, it was a completely different thing to what I think most of us are describing it today. I think there's an opportunity here for the developers to really up the ante and, and, and almost coerce the occupiers mm -hmm. into performing. Um, and, and that's incumbent on all of us. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ollie, um, let's get our second poll question um, done. Okay, uh, this is poll two of three. So um, out of the following options, what will be your top priority when considering your next project? Will it be reducing embodied carbon through construction? Is it reducing operational carbon throughout the life cycle of the building? Is it neither of those options or is it both together? And it's probably just worth saying whilst you're selecting one of those four, we've deliberately left out sequestered carbon, although we would just kind of leave that thought with you guys. And is that something that is, is being considered? Uh, should there be more work done on it? Should there be more um, respect given to, to sequestered carbon? So if you could just select one of those four, please. Drum roll. Okay, it's just coming up now. Uh, okay, so uh, a whopping 79% said both, which is good to hear. 18% uh, was reducing embodied carbon, 3% reducing operational carbon, um, and 0% said neither. So that's quite a positive outcome, I think, Matt. Great. Thanks for that, everyone. Okay, so let's move on to uh, market and market values. Um, so Michael and Dan Mead, uh, what is your view on achievable annual rents or disposal values of mass timber stroke commercial offices in the London and UK market? Uh, Michael and Dan. So I think part of this harks back to what I was saying before about supply and demand. I think there's, there's definitely a moment in time now whereby the demand and frankly the supply, because you know the, there are there are probably ten what I would call major CLT schemes that are either in the pipe or being brought to the to the market in in the whole of central London, and I think there's a piece here. If I use that Clerkenwell example, is it's, it's usual agency smoke and mirrors here, but we're not we're not quoting a rent. We're, what we're actually doing is seeing who comes to the table uh, in terms of the tenant profile. And, and, and assessing on an individual basis how strong their ESG, um, you know, sort of statement is and, and, and seeing if that's an opportunity just to crank the handle a, a little bit. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, obviously the bumps in the road like COVID come along, 
But I think for premium products, whether it be, you know, Timber Square, Roots in the Sky, you know, a handful of other examples, that there is an absolute opportunity to drive premiums. And I don't want to, I'm not going to be the guy that says, oh yeah, it should be 10%, 20%, because I genuinely believe there's, there's quite a lot of elasticity in this, because again, it comes down to just a shortfall of supply. Now, don't get me wrong, if you, if you knock up a, a timber building that looks like a garden shed and expect it to let in a heartbeat, you know, I think you're going to be sadly mistaken. I think there are a number of other kind of elements that come hand in hand with that, as we've talked about, you know, at length earlier in the call. But I think if you get those, get those key factors right, I think there's a genuine opportunity to outperform the local market there. Right. I think ju just, just to add to Mike's point, I suppose a little bit of an aside, you know, will we move into a world where a landlord's business is um, kind of viewed favorably or not in terms of who they lease their building to mm. i mean it's really interesting that you're looking at their credentials mike because i assume general projects want to get the most sustainable companies in there to pay the best terms and that may have an impact on the investment market and perhaps your cost of capital Absolutely. you know I, I would say that i'm not going to name any names but there are a couple of occupiers in the market at the moment who have been turned down by landlords because of their supply chains and I think from a governance perspective, that is increasingly interesting, you know, and, and we are, we are moving into that world where I said it before, there'll be absolute scrutiny. Yeah. No, no, so I think that it's, it's a really interesting point from other down there. And I think we already have that system really, which is, you know, we look at covenant, we look at tenant profile, you know, within a building or within a, in, in an estate. So it's already there, the, the framework's there to, to, to move on from and you know we we wouldn't be the only landlord that have taken that view on tenants even in this relatively tricky leasing market where we've maybe turned down conversations with tenants because we're not sure about you know what their what their background business is is so I, I i totally agree with that i think just to pick up on mike's point about the market and i let the agents talk about percentages and and rents and and, and put numbers down but uh, his points on supply and demand are, are, are right if you're creating the best you know if you're creating the best product in in, in class then it should be more than one person one tenant interested in your building therefore you should be able to create some kind of um you know uh, pressure on an upward pressure on rent but i think the bit that's really interesting that we haven't talked about is outside of all of the wider esg bit um and um, sort of environment coming back to the carbon impact the carbon impact is something that we can technically price right so if you're Coca-Cola and you've and you slept walked into making a commitment to achieve net carbon zero by 2030 or whatever, there is a way you can get there quickly, which is to is to offset, right? But actually, if you can come to a building where you've already got some of that value benefit baked into the build and the embodied um, piece that comes after it, then there must be some way of marrying that up. I, lay, I leave that to the agents to work out and make the market, but that's that's the bit that we also kind of um, hope will come through. I, th I think some of the TCFD and, you know, some of Larry Fink's stuff at the moment as well, I mean, you can offset, but I think there's going to be increasing um, view on, you know, what are the governance around these companies? Yeah, exactly. Would you, would you go over there and do it for a dollar a, a tonne or whatever, or do you do it? you know, uh, number pound is 65 quid a, a, a ton or whatever it is, you know, is that arguably too low to, you know, I don't know, we're kind of developing that, but it's moving very quickly and it will have a price impact on on it at some point. And I think, sorry, there's, there's also something in the investment market as well. I mean, I think if you, I mean, not, not doing people a disservice, but I think if you speak to most investment agents at the moment, you know, ESG focus is probably not at the top of their list of kind of interests. Um, but you, you look at, you know, look at patron capital, you look at the family offices, you look at the Blackstones, the Black Rocks, they're all creating ESG focused investment funds. And so if you're a developer and you're the principal, you're building out your asset, well, go figure, you know, there's only a handful of assets that those big investment houses can put their money into going forward. So, you know, when, when they're chasing, the product when it's on the market you'd like to see that there be some yield compression off the result of your building being you know highly sustainable and and aesthetically desirable yeah and i think just to add to that that that's where the education bit comes back again mike is that you know in it increasingly and in an exponential 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 way um buyers funders um, agents even will get will get cute to just greenwashing across buildings and say, well, okay, well, I've got an ESG building here. Why? Because you've got 
you've got some bike stands in the basement you know people will want more and more and more um but, but there is that going on and people just kind of walk into those investments but i think people are going to get much more educated much more quickly about what they're what they're actually buying and, and ask for more and that's where you know the real development comes so. Dan, I think that's just that is about overused word alert, but it's about the authenticity of the business. Like you know, when you walk into that boardroom, if these people, you know, generally care or have just picked it up. Yeah. This is where I think the value driver. Sorry, Matt, I know you're trying to wrap it. Right. This is where the value driver comes. This is fundamentals of knowing what your customer wants. If yeah. you're delivering a product and a, the authenticity uh, that that customer wants, be it an investor or a tenant, they'll pay a premium for it. We know that. So it's, it's, it's back to the fundamentals and the game's changing, it's keeping up. Right, so two more key questions I wanna get in before we go on to our last poll question. So this, this one here, Dan, uh, Dan Hamlet, is for you. Uh, what do you believe could be achieved through tax and levies, et cetera, uh, or other incentives maybe uh, for adopting sustainable buildings and how likely do you think this is in the near future? Um, I just want to get that one in because I just want to get the, the, the sort of carrot and stick bit in. Probably fairly quick, maybe not wholly comprehensive answer is I think, you know, watching these series of webinars, I think the market, you know, is getting there. And, you know, to quote Bill Gates, you know, we can mobilise capital to reduce the time and monetary costs of green premiums. But also think we can need to push for well, and help shape government intervention. And that intervention, you know, in conjunction with a code of practice, you know, will obviously help us get there more quickly. And frankly, you know, if you look at the gravity of the situation, you know, that that has to happen, doesn't it? If everyone's got these targets, it has to happen and include the government in that. Cool. Thank you for that. So, uh, Kevin, it would be remiss of us not to ask the um, an international uh, example uh, question of, of you, of being where, you're, where, where you're, your business is. Um, so, uh, are you aware of any international timber projects and, and the types of occupied tenants that have taken up these spaces, uh, just to give you a, a chance to summarise those points? Yeah, sure. And um, thanks for the question. Um, I think probably most of you do know we've had the, the good fortune of delivering three um, timber buildings now uh, in Australia. Uh, the first one was at Barangaroo uh, in Sydney, um, next door to the Rogers Towers, um, known as International House. And to be honest, if you Google these, you'll get as many images as you could, you could ever wish for. So number one went up, that was about 75,000 square feet. Uh, it was a concrete structure that came out of the ground and then the timber went on top of the uh, ground floor structure. Um, so it was fully timber above ground. Um, it was leased pretty quickly to Accenture. Um, it went up well. We learned a lot in the process of putting that building up. I think uh, the one phrase that kept coming up was weather protection. Don't underestimate the damage that uh, water can do. Um, so that was the first one out. The architects on that were Tizans uh, in Australia who did a really good job. And then we had two following that in sort of 2018-19. Uh, one was a neighbour to International House called Daramu House. Uh, Daramu House is the sort of Aboriginal for tree house, I think. Uh, this sat alongside International House. Um, similar size, about 75,000 square feet. Um, that was leased up to WeWork. So again, they were looking to get an advantage in the Sydney market for co-working and, and flex. Um, similar, same architect, similar design, sort of ground of concrete, and then the timber went up from that. And then finally, this was probably being built at the same time as Daramu House, which is 25 King Street in Brisbane, part of the showgrounds uh, development. This was a bit bigger. Uh, this was about 150,000 square feet. Um, this nine stories, again, above a ground floor, sort of concrete structure. Uh, we worked on this with Oricon uh, quite early on in the piece, and they were one of our first tenants into the building. Um, so we had, a, we had a really good journey with those guys getting that, that building uh, delivered. But I think that the sort of one take out is that, you know, the, these buildings aren't necessarily cheaper. Um, they do take a little bit longer in design. Um, construction is quicker. Um, I think the, the, the one thing that was flagged was you've got to have 
sort of fast hook times. Your, your pace of build is determined by how quickly you can crane it into place. So you will have limitations in certain locations around that. Um, but if you've got your crane set up well, then you can really take some time out of your delivery uh, program. But look, the feedback has been uh, really good, really positive. Um, and I think we've learned a lot from those buildings, uh, particularly the two um, of Barangaroo. Great, thank you for that, it's brilliant, thank you. Uh, Ollie, do you want to do our third poll question? Yes, please, Matt. This is a, a really good question, we think. So, uh, from the options below, what is your key driver to build mass timber commercial offices as developers? Is it net zero targets? Is it health and well-being of end users? Is it to attract investment? Is it to attract a wider variety of tenant? Is it to achieve higher yields and values? Is it to be on trend? Now, unfortunately, you can only tick one of these, but um, if you would be able to tick them now, we'll feedback the results. So whilst that's coming in, guys, just be ready because I'll ask you for some quick fire answers of what you see the future as uh, after this poll question before I then just wrap up. So it'll be quick one-liners from you. Okay, coming through now, guys. Uh, right, a whopping 71% said net, z net zero targets, which is interesting given our, our earlier poll in the series uh, today. Um, you know, 9% health and well-being of end users, 9% attract investment, 3% attract a wider variety of tenants, 6% achieve higher yields and values. That's interesting. And 3% to be on trend. And back to you, Matt. Thanks a lot. Okay, right. Um, we haven't got time unfortunately, for any live questions that we've received in. So what we'll do, we'll pick those up in our summary report. So our panelists will answer those um, outside of here and we'll include those in our summary report as we normally would. But just to um, finish up with uh, the panellists um, today, and thank you all, because I think it's been a really, really interesting session. Um, just to pick up, really, how do you see uh, mass timber change in the next five years in, in, your, in your particular areas? So if you want to just have uh, 30 seconds each, that'd be brilliant. So, Michael, you're in the top right, left hand, left hand part of my screen. Do you want to start that? Um, off the top of my head, I think we will start to see higher or mid-rise to higher buildings being built there seems to be a general malaise in europe around building anything you know over five or six stories you know i've seen prototypes and i've seen things being built there's a there's a there's a big tower block in berlin that's going to be built um shortly i think it's about 26 stories so i think i think you know whether it be 100 clt or clt hybrid i'd like to think that that would start to change the landscape in london great thank you uh, Dan Mead? Um, it's less an answer to your question, it's more an observation on the poll actually. Um, I, I think we need to, over the next five years, if we remember why we're doing this ultimately, why we, to Dan Hamner's point, um, you know, why are we doing all this? Well, we're, we're doing it to save the planet for one of the better phrase at the end of it, which is the ultimate aim. And if we do that, if we aim for net carbon zero, if we all do it, then we will achieve all of the, the aims that, that come below that, will attract tenants, will attract investment, We'll, we'll make all of those um, those wins along the way. And hopefully that's what people will see over the next five years is that that playing out. Great. Dan Handler? You're on mute, Dan. Sorry. Um, just really quickly breaking it down to supply and demand. So, you know, from the supply side, you know, with the right frameworks in place um, and intervention, I think it's going to be scaled up, you know, especially with the need to future-proof assets. You know, we talk about TCFD, COP26 on the horizon, you know, some great stuff happening. You know, on the demand occupier side, I just think it's going to be the sweet spot for the progressive corporate. You know, I really believe that. And we said before, if you properly explain it and it's received properly, you know, it can solve business problems. And frankly, it can allow a recalibration of social norms to stakeholder capitalism. So put simply, you know, it is a physical manifestation of business purpose. And I think it will act as a magnet to get talent back into the office. And what I'm really excited about is cool buildings like Technique, you know, Timber Yard, we're going to have a proof of concept and I do think occupiers are going to pay more for it because they're going to mm. want it because it just captures the zeitgeist. And from there, I think it will really motor on. So I do think there's a pioneering premium to be had and an early doctor premium over the next five years. But right. after that, I really do see it more mass market. So super exciting time. Thanks, Dan. Kevin, last word, 10 seconds if you can. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Look, I just think Timber is going to be the poster child for something bigger. You know, this, we've got a bigger story to tell around purpose, neighbourhood, ethics, and Timber's just chapter one. So there's a lot more to write yet. 
Great, thanks. Thank you all so much. That was a really good session. Um, so, um, Laura, if you can just put our slide up just to excite people for our next session. So you can nurse your hangovers when the pubs are open the day before and hopefully get out of bed for Tuesday the 13th of April. Uh, we have got an, an amazing lineup of um, some, um, you know, Brilliant, brilliant architects who are well known to us all, I'm sure. Certainly if they aren't as individuals, which I'll be surprised at, um, their organisations will be. So that is uh, a stellar lineup in terms of um, what we're looking at um, next time, which is going to be on architecture and design. So really, really looking forward to that. And don't forget to get any questions you want um, to be asked for that session. will help us shape the session for you. Um, so get those in on, on the mastimbergardener.com um email and that's about it so um thank you all for your time again this morning thank you to our panelists and uh, that's all we've got time for so thank you everyone take care cheers bye thank you